All right, hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's uh, webinar is uh, one in our on is another episode in our ongoing series on uh, CAFC's development of screening tools for FASD. Uh, today, the title of today's webinar is Identifying the Invisible, Screening for Youth Offenders with FASD. Um, and this uh, webinar series is, is based on CAFC's work uh, with the Public Health Agency to develop uh, screening tools for, uh, for children and youth identified and potentially affected by FASD. And this is work that's been ongoing for the last couple of years. Uh, we've had a series of webinars. We have the toolkit itself and all of the tools that are up on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so if there's any background information that anyone needs while they're uh, watching the webinar or following the webinar, please go to the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network and just search for FASD or screening tools and you should be able to find it. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC and it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, some of our speakers today. Some of them will be, uh, actually I think all of them are familiar names. I think all of them have participated in some of our previous webinars. Um, and uh, this will be the, our usual process where we allow people to uh, type in questions as we're going along. You should see a little question box in the panel that usually appears on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and uh, again, I always encourage people to type the questions in as they think of them. Don't wait until we call for questions. That way you don't forget the questions and we can get a good sense of uh, what the number of questions are, etc. We also regularly get the question of will the uh, the presentations be sh be shared following the following this presentation, the powerpoints, etc. Uh, any presentations that are shared with me will be shared uh, with you uh, through the Knowledge Exchange Network, and we also record the full audio visual uh, presentation as well, and we post that on the Knowledge Exchange Network as well. Uh, so without any uh, further ado, I'd uh, like to introduce the first of our presenters, who's a familiar name to all anyone who's participated in, in our FASD screening webinars. Dr. Ab Chudley is currently the Medical Director of the Genetics and Metabolism Program within the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority and is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health and the Department of Biochemistry and Medical Genetics at the University of Manitoba. He's certainly a nationally renowned expert in uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Uh, he's also uh, one of the leads uh, with NeuroDevNet now, more recently. I think maybe that needs to be updated on his bio here, since I don't think that I see that in there. Um, and he's also on CAFC's uh, steering committee for our program to develop uh, the, uh, a toolkit of screening tools. And, and as always, I'd also like to mention, if I didn't mention it earlier, um, that all of this work is supported with the help of the Public Health Agency of Canada. So we always like to thank them for their support of this important work. Uh, so I'd like to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Chudley. Well, thanks, Doug. And I'd like to... Uh... Welcome to all of our viewers and listeners uh, across Canada and beyond. I hear that there have been over 70 people registering. That probably equates to uh, many more than 70 who have joined us. It's always a delight to share recent research as it relates to the National Screening Tool for FASD Individuals. And today we're talking about identifying the invisible screening for youth offenders with FASD that have... Uh, had some connections with the justice system. And um, we have a number of speakers today that will inform us about uh, recent advances in, in researches. Before I do the introductions, I, I have a, a very short polling question that you probably saw up on the viewer, uh, uh, just uh, getting people's uh, perception of what the percentage of young offenders do you think uh, are affected by FASD. Uh, within the justice system. Now, the, the options are 2%, 10%, 20%, or 50%. So if you want to put that in the, uh, the chat area, and uh, Doug will aggregate the responses and then inform us about what uh, your views or opinions are about the likely percentage. I don't think there's going to be a right answer here, but... Um, if you wouldn't mind then filling in this uh, quick poll, and uh, and then I'll begin with my uh, my introductions. Yeah, so uh, lots of people are already responding, but for those of you, uh, just uh, click up on the screen uh, to select your answer. Just point your your mouse cursor and click on the screen, and that will record your answer. We've got most of the uh, responses are in, so we'll just give it another second here for any last minute uh, responses. All right, and we'll just close that off. 
And it looks like uh, 46% of uh, the audience uh, has said 50% of young offenders are affected. Uh, 43% of the audience has said uh, 20% of offenders. 11% uh, said 10% of offenders. And nobody said only 2%. Well, it looks like it's an informed group. Um, I think the only uh, published study on youth offenders in Canada uh, from BC with a high-risk offending group suggested about 23% of offenders. Uh, again, there may have been a selection issue there, but um, I, I think it's probably anybody who said between 20 and 50% is, uh, or between 10 and 50 percent is probably correct somewhere. I don't have data for our own uh, uh, institution, but uh, adult prisons is a study that was done a few years ago, and the report was recently released. Uh, in terms of adults in a federal prison, one federal prison on the prairies in Canada estimated between 10 and 14 percent of those. So I think it is higher in the youth uh, court system. Um, I think it's probably in the area of around 20%, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, future re research should inform us about uh, whether or not that, that's the, uh, the estimate. At any rate, it is high, and it may vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So um, I, we, we, had, we, we were going to be having other questions, but they just didn't materialize, but I thought that would be a helpful uh, thing to, uh, to review. So, uh, without any further uh, delays, I'm going to uh, introduce the first speaker, and um, and I'll introduce, actually, um, summarize all of the speakers uh, before, uh, and then we'll go into the uh, uh, presentations. So, I, I hope everybody can hear me fine. I'm on a phone, not on a, a microphone. Is, is this uh, sound okay, Doug? Yep, no, it sounds great. Great. So, um, Deepa Sing Singal is a uh, PhD uh, student in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba, and uh, she has an interest in population health and health services research with a specific interest in the prevalence and prevention of FASD. Uh, Deepa's dissertation will investigate the characteristics and health care use of women who have given birth to children with FASD in Manitoba. Uh, this will be the first study that will investigate this cohort at a population level using longitudinal and administrative data. This study will provide important information regarding the underlying causes and influencing social determinants of health on drinking during pregnancy, which is important for the development of effective prevention strategies. Deepa is the recipient of the Manitoba Health Research Council Award. Uh, the, the next uh, speakers uh, will... Um, will be uh, Howard Bloom and Sheila Burns uh, following Deepa's uh, presentation. Um, Howard uh, completed his uh, PhD at the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and the Department of Adult Education and Counseling Psychology. Uh, Dr. Bloom holds a master's degree in uh, education with a specialization in human development and applied psychology. And since 1996, Dr. Bloom has worked as an educator program director, administrator, workshop, and conference presenter, advocate, counselor, and consultant. Uh, Dr. Bloom is a full-time professor and program coordinator at Georgian College in the School of Human Services, Child and Youth Worker Program, Aurelia Campus. His partner today in the presentation on the Ontario Youth Probation Officer Study is Sheila Burns. Uh, Sheila brings expertise from Ontario through an extensive training and consultation practice focusing on sustainable management, case management, diagnosis, and capacity building. She's the lead of the FASD Ontario Network of Expertise, Justice Working Group, and past chair of the organization. Sheila was the Law Foundation of, Mon of Ontario Community Leadership and Justice Fellow and developed course work, uh, frameworks for college and postgraduate studies stakeholder engagement, and research. The research done in collaboration with uh, Dr. Howard Bloom at Georgian College and community partners identifies the opportunities and challenges of implementing the Asante Center FASD screening and referral tool for youth probation officers in one region in Ontario. So those are our uh, esteemed speakers uh, uh, this uh, morning and this afternoon, depending where you're from. Uh, we're, we're, uh, our first speaker then is Deepa Singhal, and she's going to 
talk about the Manitoba Youth uh, Justice Studies. Uh, Deepa. Thanks, Dr. Chadley. Uh, I just want to make sure, can everyone see my screen? The... Yep. Huh? Yep. Yeah. Yep, we, okay. we can see it and we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to uh, present the work that we've been doing in Manitoba that is evaluating the applicability um, of a scooting tool that was developed uh, in British Columbia to aid youth probation officers in recognizing young offenders with possible uh, FASD. And why can I not? There we go. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge our study team, Dr. Chudley, Ms. Teresa Brown, um, the staff at Manitoba Youth Justice, the probation officers at, uh, from Manitoba Youth Justice, um, as well as our funding agencies, um, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers and the Public Health Agency of Canada for their support. Um, so today I'll go over uh, some background about the Manitoba Youth Justice FASD program and some of the great stuff that's uh, being done there in Manitoba. Um, and then go through the two studies that um, comprise this study, a retrospective study that's uh, completed and a prospective study that's currently in progress. Um, and then I want to um, uh, talk about some key messages or some take home messages, um, create some dialogue around uh, challenges in conducting real world community based research. Um, and I hope that this study can be a platform for implementation of screening tools um, in other cities. So we um, speculate that a substantial proportion of youth um, are diagnosed with FASD, who are diagnosed with FASD are involved in um, justice systems. And we know that it's a very difficult condition to diagnose and identify. Um, and this complexity often results in youth falling through the gaps um, in various systems, justice systems, education systems, and healthcare systems. Um, but particularly in the justice system, it's important to identify youth with FASD uh, to ensure fair treatment and consideration for sentencing and rehabilitation. So the Asante Center in um, British Columbia has designed a screening tool um, that aids youth probation officers in recognizing young offenders with possible FASD. Um, and this tool is designed to increase the capacity and confidence of probation officers across Canada to identify youth um, who may require a full FASD assessment. So the um, Manitoba FASD Youth Justice Program was a program implemented um, in Manitoba in 2004 as a pilot project, um, and then it was fully funded by the province of Manitoba in 2006. And this program screens, diagnoses, and aids in the rehabilitation of young offenders with FASD. Um, however, currently there is no validated and systematic way uh, for center staff to screen or identify youth who are at risk for FASD. Currently, um, staff at the Manitoba Youth Justice Centre are using what we call the red flag method. So um, they were previously trained when this program was first implemented um, to look for risk factors of FASD. Um, and uh, so staff would look out for these risk factors in the youth that they deal with and then refer the youth who are at risk for FASD to the FASD program, um, where FASD program staff would then further investigate alcohol history, their medical history, and engage with the family. Um, they would then refer these youth, if alcohol history was confirmed, uh, to physicians who are specializing in diagnosing FASD for a full diagnostic assessment. So since 2004, there's been um, 653 referrals made from the staff to the, M to the uh, FASD program, um, and there was 184 full diagnostic assessments conducted since 2004, and out of those assessments, 132 uh, youth have received diagnoses of FASD after their full diagnostic assessment. So from an academic perspective, um, we can say that there is no validated and systematic way for center staff to screen for or identify youth. The red flag uh, method has been working so far, um, but it, there's no, they are not using a formalized tool. We don't know how many probation officers um, receive formal training. Uh, there could have been new probation officers who have come in since the uh, original training was done. 
Um, you know, but when we say this as an academic, from the academic perspective, in the real world, it, it's a loaded statement. Um, some staff at the um, Manitoba Youth Justice Centre feel that the red flag method is working. Um, and they feel that the implementation of a screening tool uh, may be time consuming, may be costly, um, and they feel that maybe perhaps probation officers, you know, aren't willing to fill out a screening tool for um, the use that they suspect because they're happy with the way things are going right now. So these are some of the challenges with conducting community-based research. Uh, the first point is that we need to be careful with our language. Um, you know, in academics, we say things like validated and systematic, um, and they aren't so loaded as they are uh, for the people in the front lines who have um, spent their time developing the systems that they currently have in place. Um, and also we need buy-in from key stakeholders in order to um, conduct our research um, and make the changes that we want to make. But um, we'll be discussing uh, the necessary, um, the necessity for buy-in in a few um, later slides. So the purpose of our research was to assess how valid, applicable, and accurate the Asante Probation Officer screen is in facilitating FASD diagnosis among young offenders in Manitoba. And we undertook two studies um, in order to answer these questions. So the first one was a retrospective chart review, which we completed, and the second is a prospective study, which is currently in progress. So the retrospective chart review, um, we applied the Asante tool to existing charts and included um, youth who were admitted to the uh, Manitoba Youth Corrections uh, between 2006 and 2009. And we had only included charts um, of youth who had a probation officer and a pre-sentence report. Uh, and this ensured that only charts with comprehensive information would be reviewed. Uh, for example, charts of youth who were admitted for one day wouldn't have enough information to fill out the Asante tool, um, and so that, that would bias the results of our evaluation, so we didn't include uh, those types of charts. Um, 378 charts uh, met our inclusion um, criteria. So our research, our specific research questions were, we first wanted to um, find out if there was indeed adequate information in the chart to fill out the Asante uh, screen tool in a meaningful and a useful way. And so we conducted um, a pilot uh, a pilot run of 30 charts with the tool and we did find that there was enough information most of the time to fill out the tool so we carried on with the study. Uh, we then um, investigated the proportion of youth who were screened positive for being at risk for FASD by the Asante Asante screen. Um, the percentage who screened negative or had missing information. And then we looked at the sensitivity and specificity of the tool. Oh, and this seems to be a repeat slide. So uh, we did go through it, so I can skip that slide. Um, so 70 youth were screened positive using the Asante tool, and 36 of these youth were referred to the um, FASD program using the red flag method. 38 were screened negative using the tool, and none of these youth were referred to the program using the red flag method. Uh, and 215 youth had missing information, and out of these, 69 youth were referred to uh, the program. So the, the large percentage of youth who had missing information um, what this means is that they did not have enough information. Um, if any of you are familiar with the screening tool, there's two sections, section A and B, um, and it's a checklist that you go through. And then at the end, um, there's a, a little algorithm that says if youth had two social factors from section A or, or a factor from section B, they should be referred to for further diagnostic assessment. So the, um, the percentage of youth who had missing information um, either didn't have enough information in either section A or section B to reach a definitive conclusion uh, with the tool. So among the charts with enough information to fill out the Sante Center tool and determine if youth were at risk or not at risk for FASD, there were 36 true positive cases. And when comparing with the children who were actually referred by the red flag method, um, there were 34 positive cases, uh, 34 false positive cases. So the sensitivity of the Asante tool compared to the current referrals made to um, the program were 34%. And charts with missing information and charts that screen negative were used as the total number of charts 
uh, that were screened negative by the Asante tool to determine specificity. So among these charts, 184 youth were screened negative by the Asante Center tool and were not referred to um, the FASD program. And 69 were screened negative by the tool but were referred to the FASD program. So the specificity of the tool compared to the current referrals made by the red flag method was 84%. Uh, so although the sensitivity of the tool is relatively low at 34%, it's important to consider that the tool is being compared to the current red flag method, uh, where there is no systematic methodology used to refer children and adolescents at a high risk for FAC uh, for further assessment. So a definitive conclusion cannot be made, stating the youth who are being screened positive by the center tool are not at high risk for FASD because they may not have previously been referred to the FASD program as there is no gold standard for a referral. So staff could have been missing these youth uh, due to lack of training or awareness of FASD uh, or not enough time spent by the youth or lack of obvious symptoms exhibited by the youth. Um, so we can conclude that the Sante Center screening tool has reasonable specificity uh, indicating that it's better at ruling out youth who are not at risk for FASD. Um, so the Sante Center School does screen more youth to be at higher risk for FASD than the current red flag method. Uh, we know that the tool is more specific than sensitive. Um, and we know that there's a high proportion of missing information um, in existing charts that prohibit a def definitive conclusion regarding further FASD assessment using the center tool. Uh, so perhaps this is reflective of the fact that uh, particular information on the tool is difficult to collect for probation officers. For example, if the youth have siblings uh, with documented FASD um, or maternal alcohol history uh, is often not available. And so this missing information um, can be attributed to, you know, perhaps the, the, fa the staff at probation officers um, may not be asking enough questions uh, to accurately red flag youth to further FASD uh, assessment. Um, it's important to note that more children and adolescents may have been red flagged using the current method in recent years uh, due to increased awareness of FASD throughout the uh, corrections program. Um, and so this trend wouldn't be uh, picked up by this review. So we feel that there's um, a possibility that staff could be missing youth at risk for FASD with the current red flag method. But before we recommend the tool be implemented, uh, we felt that a prospective study that compares the red flag method to the screening tool should be um, conducted. And we do feel that the implementation of the Asante tool um, can for encourage further awareness of FASD in the young offender population. So we continued on with our work and designed um, a prospective study that compared the current red flag screening method used um, at Manitoba Youth Justice to the Asante Probation Officer Screening Tool. Um, and an important part of this prospective study was a feedback component regarding the ease and effectiveness of the tool uh, from probation officers. So our specific research questions for the prospective study uh, were to um, calculate the proportion of youth screen positive using the current red flag method, and then to go on and see how many of these youth referred a full FAC diagnostic assessment, um, to see how many youth were screened positive using the center screening tool, and to see how many of these youth received a full diagnostic assessment and then to look at the opinions of probation officers on the ease and usefulness of the tool, as well as the red flag method in identifying youth with potential FASD. So our study participants were probation officers. Um, these are key personnel who can help identify youth at high risk for FASD. We recruited probation officers across four um, sites. Uh, throughout Manitoba and randomized them to two groups. So group one um, would use the Asante tool to screen for FASD, and group two uh, would use their current method, the red flag method. Um, so group one applied the Santa Center screening tool to all youth who were assigned to their caseload during the study period, uh, which was six months. And um, they also would use our inclusion criteria of using youth only with, who, with PSRs ordered. 
Um, they would fill a data collection sheet out at the end of the month asking how many new youth they referred um, for an FASD to the FASD program using the Asante Center screen. And they would have a survey at the end of the six month period um, uh, regarding their feedback on the tool. Um, our control group is the um, red flag approach. So these probation officers would just continue using their red flag approach, business as usual. Uh, they would fill out a data collection sheet at the end of the month asking how many new youth they referred to the FASD program. And they also had a survey at the end of the study period. So we just completed um, phase one in January, which was the recruitment and training of probation officers. We have 21 uh, youth probation officers uh, recruited for our study across Manitoba, which was a great recruitment rate. I think only you know one or two probation officers uh, didn't want to participate in the study due to uh, their time restrictions. Uh, we're now into phase two, which is our data collection from probation officers. So they have six months. Um, of data collection uh, and then we'll progress into phase three which is following up the youth that were um, referred to the FASD program to see the proportion of youth of those youth who um, who got a full diagnostic assessment and then a diagnosis um, and then we hope to be finished in June 2014 with our study write-up and a publication. So now I'd like to create a, a bit of a dialogue, which may be difficult um, in cyberspace, but we do have our uh, handy chat window and our questions. Um, so this is a dialogue I hope to create from the results of the first study um, and some of the challenges um, in finding the result from the um, perspective study. So for anyone who's looking to conduct work in the justice um, system, research in the justice system, um, there's a lot of ethical challenges with conducting research in such a vulnerable population. Not only do we have to um, get permission from the university uh, ethics board, we also needed to um, engage judges um, throughout the Manitoba Youth Corrections um, and the administrative um, people through Manitoba Youth uh, Corrections. And these um, ethic approvals for the judges um, and the men take a long time to obtain. So this should be factored into anyone conducting research. Um, you know, it took months. I had to get a background check, a very extensive background check to work with the data um, in this population. Um, and although the probation officers were our primary study participants for our uh, prospective study, uh, we were using records of youth involved. So one of the members of our university ethics board um, said that we'd have to obtain verbal consent from the youth, uh, which brings up issues of retention, privacy, and stigmatization. You know, we did not want um, youth to feel that the probation officers were telling them that they did have FASD, uh, you know, and so since this is the first month of data collection, I am interested to see um, if youth uh, did give their permission to use their records um, or if they uh, were hesitant to do so due to the stigma around FASD. And so community engagement was a, was a very key piece in conducting this research, um, especially if our goal was to ultimately have the screening tool implemented. It's very important to have support and engagement from key players who are on the front lines. So we had buy-in from key members of the community through various meetings and presentations that we did. So um, but the key members of the community for us were members of the Youth Justice Program, the judges, the administration, and the probation officers. And we wanted to emphasize their importance um, in their role of the study, the importance of their feedback, and emphasize the positive study implications um, to youth, because ultimately that's what we're working for, the well-being of these youth. Um, this in community engagement was critical to increasing the likelihood that the screening tool will be used if we do recommend that it be implemented. And it's critical to increasing the capacity of justice centers to identify youth at high risk for FASD. Uh, we showed appreciation for studies participants' time um, by throwing a pizza lunch. Uh, we we know we did we hosted the pizza lunch during their lunch hour so that they could come in, the probation officers, um, and see what the study was about see if they were interested in participating, give their consent and be trained um, in the study. And it worked quite well. And another key component to conducting research that's based in the community is knowledge translation. So we will be providing a one-pager of study results 
and our conclusions for each study participant upon completion of the study. And um, we'll want to disseminate uh, the results and the design of our study to any other jurisdiction um, that wants to um, implement the Asante screening tool in their own city to enhance the screening capacity across the country. Um, and so we want to use the feedback from the probation officers um, to adapt the screen, perhaps, uh, to implement this in Manitoba. Um, and we hope that this study, again, will be a platform to assess the applicability of the center, Asante Center screening tool in any other city or jurisdiction. And we feel that the tool will enhance the cap uh, capabilities of probation officers to accurately screen for FASD. Um, and it may ensure that more youth who require full diagnostic assessments receive these services, which ultimately increase the well-being of the um, young offenders afflicted with FASD by increasing the fairness or appropriateness of sentences um, and tailoring their rehabilitation and treatment. Thank you. All right, thanks, Deepa. I think, I think uh, this generates a number of... Uh, questions, I'm sure, uh, among the audience, and if you could probably put those questions uh, in the chat area, and uh, Doug will uh, compile them, and we will have a, an opportunity to uh, look at those uh, questions, as many of them as possible, hopefully all of them, in the time that we'll have uh, to uh, discuss questions with answers following uh, the next presentation. So, um, without any... Uh, Further delay, I think I'd like to move into the uh, second presentation by Sheila Burns and uh, Dr. Howard Bloom on the Ontario Youth Probation Officer Study. So I'll hand this over to our next speakers. Hello, everybody. Hello. So uh, Sheila Burns and myself uh, worked uh, collaboratively to, uh, with a group of Ontario Youth Probation Officers uh, our project was really about training and implementation uh, and use of the Asante Center FASD screening tool, a screening and referral tool. Um, we want to acknowledge the uh, Law Foundation of Ontario and their support towards this project, uh, and also want to acknowledge Georgian College and their uh, support towards this applied research. So, we, as many of you know, um, you indicated in, in the responses about uh, the number of youth who may be involved in the justice system, that certainly 20% or more of youth who are involved uh, uh, in the justice system uh, have an FASD. And we know that in Ontario, we've been somewhat behind in terms of identifying those youth um, and helping to divert them into the appropriate programming. So the genesis of, of this research was really built on, uh, on a need perceived in the community uh, by uh, colleagues in the youth justice system to, uh, to start to identify youth uh, in a systemic way in order to, to see if we can um, do some better work with those youth and and to start to provide them the kinds of services they need. Um, and so the, the Asante Center tool um, provided a platform for us to explore, uh, explore the, a, a way to screen for FASD. Um, we knew that the tool had been circulated by a, a youth justice um, colleague uh, uh, in, in 2009 and 10, um, but we also knew that it, it had been done informally and that the tool wasn't being used. So we wanted to, to um, we knew that there, we suspected there was value in using a screening tool, but we also wanted to make sure that all of the um, elements were in place for a screen to happen in an effective, appropriate way, um, and that it was usable and helpful for youth probation officers. Um, so we knew that it had been uh, disseminated informally and wanted to understand how much more effective it could be if it was done in a formal way and to explore multiple factors associated with that. So what was our research question? In, in sitting and talking with ministry uh, management and uh, ministry uh, youth probation officers, we really uh, wanted to understand how how our training of probation officers on a screening tool that was designed really to help identify youth on probation who may have a, a 
fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, how this training will improve their awareness, their confidence and knowledge, and their responses when considering client plans, when they consider probation orders, and when they're recommending assessments. And really, truly, that was, the, that was the question we were looking for. So how we designed the study was um, 23 youth probation staff, that's probation officers and managers, were invited to participate in a full day of training. Of this group, uh, 19 individuals consented to participate, which included 17 youth probation officers and two managers from a regional youth probation office. Um, the group met on a training day um, at, a, uh, at a central location, uh, and um, pro the group participated in a five-hour uh, FASD in-service training that focused on FASD, that focused on the Asante Center FASD screening and referral tool. Um, and this training was done by a local lead in FASD. Of the 17 folks that are participated in the study, 13 of those individuals completed both a pre and post test to the, to the training. Uh, and that data is the data that we include in our statistical analysis, but we did include the um, qualitative data from all 17 participants. So the in-service training was done by uh, Tanya Millsap uh, from Simcoe County, and it included an introduction into FASD and a discussion on the primary disabilities that are associated with FASD and the adverse outcomes, which are commonly referred to as secondary disabilities. Uh, Tanya also explored the relevance of FASD in youth justice, as many of you already understand it, and uh, and. Uh, and there was engagement, both formal and informal, uh, around the, the specifics of the Asante Centre screening tool. Um, it was a, there was a comprehensive overview of all the relevant studies and background uh, and who uses the tool and how to use the tool. And the participants also explored the diag diagnostic pathways and a referral process available uh, for local youth. And, and that's a particularly important aspect of this research. Ethically, when you, uh, when you, uh, when we were, it, it is, there, there's a, a belief that, uh, an understanding that if we're going to identify that someone may have a disability, um, then we should also follow that up with a diagnosis. And, um, and just understanding the importance of that, that if we're, if we're um, identifying that someone may have an organic brain injury, um, then we also need to be able to follow through on that. And, and so that the uh, diagnostic pathway was developed in partnership with uh, Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, and a referral process was, was defined uh, so that any youth probation officer who used the tool, who uh, and the tool identified that there may be that FASD may be a factor, so it screens positive. That there would that then there was an actual referral process for them to go through, um, so that the youth could get uh, a diagnosis. And and from an ethical perspective, um, that's important. It also ensures it ensures that you're your community is connecting better and I think that from a practical perspective there's tremendous value in doing that if any of you are looking at using this tool. Um, the, the tool was was not looking at, uh, uh, the, our research didn't look at validating the tool um, but we certainly knew that uh, from from earlier research from British Columbia that there, there was some good validity to it. The trainer also provided maps of service uh, of services available with contact information, so that um, that youth probation officers would have an understanding of who in their community they could link with to ensure the the design and development of, of good case management. Um, there was also good exploration uh, in discussion and. Um, around case management and appropriate interventions for individuals with FASD or who may have FASD. Um, and we really encouraged a, a, a fulsomeness in that dis, in a discussion on what we can do differently to, uh, to support individuals with, a, with this organic brain uh, injury. 
think it's also important to acknowledge that although this training, this slide you see there is uh, comprehensive, uh, Sheila and I as the researchers didn't develop the training. Uh, we gave Con Sonia, uh, Tanya Millsap uh, the uh, context uh, that she had five hours to train on uh, FASD and use of the tool and that as the lead in the community, she's to develop the training that she thought would be appropriate for the, the youth probation officers. Uh, so as researchers, we didn't have any involvement in the training itself, um, uh, except uh, in this case, summarizing what she did. So, um, you know, that, I think that's important to note as well. And we also didn't test the quality of her training in the research. We weren't probing uh, the training session itself. We were probing whether training changes or impacts on, uh, on, on use and uh, confidence in the tool itself. So uh, after the um, training happened um, and the group uh, was administered a, a post-test, um, we conducted a qualitative open-ended guided conversational interview asking open-ended questions uh, that followed the in-service. Uh, and then four months after the training, so uh, th this uh, study started in April, so in October, uh, we um, followed up with a survey to uh, explore um, and assess the value, effectiveness, how the tool was being used in practice. And uh, again, for the descriptive component of this, um, we included all, all participants who responded. So based on the findings, and uh, we'll show you some details uh, of, of a few of the questions that uh, we probed, we, we, we have robust evidence that suggests that training enhances uh, probation officers' confidence to describe and implement modifications for youth who have or are suspected of having FASD. Uh, we also uh, learned that uh, it, training enhanced uh, knowledge of FASD, uh, training, uh, the training uh, had an impact on FASD profile identification, on uh, the um, awareness of referral and pathway recognition, and uh, overall confidence of probation officers uh, uh, to make a referral to, uh, to local clinics uh, who support uh, FASD diagnosis. Participants also indicated that there is a a significant value for a use of the tool in their practice. Um, and then finally, as it relates to FASD, the participants attributed the combination of training and the use of the screening tool as having the greatest impact on their practice. Participants also identified some barriers to screen, refer, and obtain a diagnosis of suspected FASD. And this gathered was this information, we'll show you that uh, uh, later on, was gathered from both the pre and post tests and the qualitative interview, and again in the follow up survey. So, this is what it looked like. Whoops. So, this is what it looked like. Uh, at four months after the training, uh, we asked the youth probation officers um, what had the best uh, impact for them, uh, the greatest impact for their practice. Uh, on their confidence when they were considering FASD. And, and, and there's a significant uh, response that indicates that the training and the tool is what makes a difference. So that just, just in-service training on FASD didn't have a significant Im an impact as, uh, as having both the training and the having the screening tool and being trained in it and also having a training in FASD. I think it's also Sheila important to note that when we surveyed the group and the data is not here that the average uh, uh, previous training in FASD that this group had was 10 hours so they, they they had overall an average of 10 hours of training prior to the session so that, I think that's important to note as well. Yeah, so these weren't, uh, FASD was not new to them, um, but there was some, there's some indication that, that having this training in uh, collaboration with the, 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 the screening tool training um, reinforces their confidence. And so here we, here we see that, that there, that the um, the self rating of knowledge, there's some significant change here. Um, uh, with people identifying that that the training moved them significantly um, from from poor and average to good and very good, and um, importantly, 
uh, that was relatively well sustained four months later, so that that, there, that this has an ongoing impact in terms of, uh, of people's understanding of the disability and their the how they perceive themselves understanding FASD. And uh, participants also reported a significant increase from pre and post training of the of the variable of how knowledgeable they felt they were to identify a profile of a youth who may be affected with FASD. And so, you know, this is really powerful for us because we see that probation officers, when we compare the pre and post, really feel more knowledgeable to identify youth and, 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 and that's certainly impacting their practice. And, and I'm just going to add in here, what's, uh, what's, is what, what makes this information really significant is that um, in, a, in a part of the data that's, that's not here is that, that all probation officers believe that they had youth who had an FASD. Uh, on their caseload, but only a third had ever made a referral for diagnosis. So that somewhere in there, there was a lack of confidence in order to uh, to feel that they could move that information <clears throat> forward and 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 uh, to to follow up on on their instinct. And so that it's really important that we see that uh, how knowledgeable they that felt and the and the shift in in their their. Uh, in their approaches. I think it's also important to acknowledge that, that yesterday I got a phone call from this local regional manager who was asking me about the results of the study and anecdotally he was telling me that there seems to be regular dialogue now around cases and FASD and applying the FASD screening tool to cases where those uh, individuals ex uh, you know, suspect uh, FASD and uh, you know are, are really talking about um, identifying profiles of youth who may have FASD. So that dialogue is happening. So we see we see a change in practice, which is truly what we had hoped we would see. Um, uh, that it's it's both uh, um, anecdotally re referenced, and also we see it here in in the outcomes that the confidence to refer youth um, yeah. following the the training has has. Uh, increased significantly um, from from very poor and poor and average to significant people feeling very confident and very good ab uh, about their ability to refer youth and have that an effective uh, um, uh, approach uh, an effective intervention. We asked uh, participants uh, both a pre and post uh, about the value, the overall value they would place on a screening tool for FASD in their practice. And this was an interesting result for us and for me uh, to explore in that um, we don't see, uh, although we see a very high value both pre and post in terms of the use of a tool in practice, there's no, there's no statistically significant change in the value that these, uh, this group, this cohort placed on a screening tool. Uh, and what we can hypothesize from this is, is certainly many things, but ultimately uh, that uh, youth probation officers value tool, this particular tool or a tool for FASD, whether they're trained or not, they really see the value of a tool in their practice. Um, and then at a post uh, test, uh, we probe the question, how valuable will be will the Asante FASD screening tool be to help you refer a youth you suspect may have an FASD for assessment? And you can see from the results here that post training, uh, there is you know, sort of robust evidence suggesting that the, all these probation officers uh, felt that there was a, a, a significant value for them to have this tool after they learned more about it. And an, an additional um, idea, a concept that, that goes with this is that um, as people become more um, uh, more familiar with the FASD profile and what they're looking for, they, some some people feel that they don't need a tool because they already know what they're looking for. That the tool is kind of a prompt, um, and those who identify themselves with the highest level of uh, of knowledge related to FASD don't find the, the tool is helpful so that it, uh, it it really does it's the trick in terms of of, uh, of of embedding a knowledge into practice and and here is the uh, and here's 
what, what people were looking at for months after after the the training, um, and we see in in this slide we see that there's increased confidence in when they use the tool in identifying youth uh, who may be affected by FASD. And we also see an, a significant increase using the tool um, for youth, for making referrals of youth who may have an FASD. And, and that is what we want, we want to, to shift the, that focus. And if it, the tool appears to uh, significantly assist youth probation officers uh, in terms of, of their comfort level, confidence and knowledge to make good referrals. We asked the question of all of the uh, participants if they suspect a client uh, may have an FASD uh, based on the Asante screening tool, would that change your case management? And in fact, 16 of the participants reported that they did ca manage cases differently and one reported that they did not manage cases differently. And here's some of the things uh, that, uh, that uh, were reported to us. Uh, again, uh, these probation officers talked about referring for diagnostic assessment, uh, adapting case management to meet the needs of their clientele, uh, changing their expectations of the youth they work with, changing uh, goals, modifying their responses to breaches, uh, using more collaborative approach to when managing their cases and managing care, uh, placing emphasis on skill building, coping strategies, life skills, modifying their communication around um, you know, more reminders, assessing uh, best methods of learning, uh, auditory, verbal, sensory um, uh, domains, and, and really talked about seeing youth more often and on a regular basis. Other parts of research, oops, I'm just gonna throw a step in here. Other parts of, of the research um, also indicate, indicated that there was a, a improved confidence in case management and case planning uh, um, reported by the youth probation officers, but there was not a significant change in confidence related to probation orders. And while we're not completely sure why that is, we'll have to look at, at to understand that, dat, that data better, but we, we do know that, we're, that the, the probation officers are feeling much uh, more confident in the way they themselves direct uh, uh, the client management. In the post questionnaire and in the follow up qualitative interview, we um, so participants identified barriers to screening. Um, we um, I, I, I used um, the data and um, thematically ana analyzed the data to reveal six major themes, which uh, is I go back to the literature. Um, really, uh, you know, uh, supports what other literature is saying around barriers to screening and barrier to identification, access to prenatal history, stigma for families, funding, transportation and logistical issues. And when I talk about that, the input was, we would love to take somebody down for a screen, but whose car do they go in? Who's paying for the driving down? you know, what car are we actually going to take? So these were really simple logistical issues that came up. Um, in terms of uh, uh, other themes, uh, availability of appropriate services and supports. And uh, there was a discussion around policy and mandate limitations. And, and so we, we also wanted to look at um, uh, where is the, the opportunity to do an FASD screen uh, best placed and, and who better to ask but the youth probation officers themselves. And, and because it, it does seem a little late in the game after someone has been uh, gone through the court system to, to be now wondering uh, whether or not there's a disability uh, that's a factor. So the so we asked them where we sh where should a screening tool occur, um, and certainly pre sentencing was a was a common um, a common response. Uh, some suggested that the police should be uh, screening. Um, at the first point of contact, and so that diversion could happen much earlier in the process. Um, the post-sentencing post by the probation officers, um, uh, again, by at any point during the process where someone queries it, um, but the, the screen should be made more available. Um, case management planning, and ideally uh, within the first three months uh, of an, uh, obtaining in an order, um, and uh, they also identified that relatives may uh, may also be uh, flagged, and that we can use 
incorporate the, the screening tool at multiple uh, opportunities. So in, in, in conclusion, um, uh, and we have other data that has come in that we haven't reported on, but in terms of the questions we asked, we see that there's robust evidence in this study to support the hypothesis that an in-service training uh, enhances probation officers' confidence to describe and implement modifications for youth who have or suspected of having FASD, uh, that training enhances knowledge of FASD, FISD, profile identification, referral pathways, recognition and confidence to make a referral. And again, participants expressed a high value level for the use of the tool in their practice. And as that relates to FASD, the participants attributed the combination of training and the use of a screening tool as having the greatest impact on their practice. It's all yours now, Doug. Thanks. Uh, um, well, we're waiting for any questions. There haven't been any come in yet, uh, but Ab, if you, if you had any uh, comments. I'm sure others have uh, lots of questions. I, I'd just like to uh, thank the speakers for very nice presentations and very clear, well done, and as it sort of sets the stage for what other prog programs could uh, be doing uh, to identify youth with FASD uh, within the court system. Now, there are some differences uh, in Manitoba. Some of the resistance to considering a new uh, screen tool was the issue of uh, the fact that the program in Manitoba was set up to see as many youth as possible pre-sentencing. So that, that this would help in terms of uh, the ultimate, uh, not so much the sentence, but the disposition and the probation orders. So that we had that built into our system that uh, we would try to see these individuals before sentencing occurred and often there was a, uh, an order by a judge to uh, do the assessment. The other thing in Manitoba is that uh, Winnipeg is central. Uh, we have um, the ability uh, to uh, gain contact with the family in the community, uh, particularly if it's in Winnipeg. We have transportation services available to bring in parents for uh, their being involved in the history taking and attending the assessment itself. Uh, so there are things that are built within our program that deal with a lot of issues that were addressed by the participants in the Ontario study that they, you know, they're about 10 years behind in terms of uh, developing a formalized program with uh, youth justice offenders. Um, the other thing is um, the fact that we have a diagnostic system almost embedded within the youth program uh, that has been ongoing for nine years. So. We don't have to go to other clinics and ask for their participation in, in seeing some of the youth. So we have a lot of advantages having uh, you know, developed the youth justice program. And uh, I have to thank uh, all, the, all the people who, are, who developed this program, Judge Harvey uh, um, uh, and uh, the um, Manitoba government and youth justice uh, Justice Manitoba, we've we've had uh, stability of several years and several terms of one government that has a, a dedication to uh, support the youth uh, who are in care as well as youth who are in trouble with the law and trying to deal with reducing crime rates and recidivism. So I think we're proud of what we've done in Manitoba and uh, we, we want to look at ways in which this can be enhanced and improved. So uh, it's possible the Asante tool for probation's uh, uh, officers in Manitoba might uh, might uh, might become a reality. But um, I'm open to other comments from other participants and uh, and questions that I might have from the audience. Well, there have been a few questions come in, so while we're thinking of any other comments, uh, maybe we'll just start uh, by, with a few of these questions. Um, Dan has asked, has there been any thought of utilizing a screen with youth or family members and seeing if there is a difference in sensitivity and specificity? Now, who wants to answer that? <laughs> oh, sorry, what was the question again? 
Uh, well, he's asking if, uh, and I'm not sure, Dan. Feel free to, uh, if, if, if for for anyone, if if we haven't sort of interpreted your question properly, please feel free to type in a, a follow up comment. Um, but he's he's asked, has there been any thought of utilizing a screen with youth or family members and seeing if there is a difference in sensitivity and specificity? Uh, so if we compared with another screening tool. We haven't compared with another screening tool in Manitoba. You know, we got sensitivity and specificity results uh, by just comparing with the, the current method that they're using now uh, because the objective of our research was to see um, if implementing, ultimately the objective is to see, you know, if the Asante tool is worth implementing in Manitoba. So the reason why we compared with the, the current way things are doing, getting done right now is to see, you know, which one is better, essentially. And uh, Sheila speaking, I just, uh, the, um, the Asante screening center screening tool and referral tool, and, and I appreciate we actually didn't have it on this uh, slide presentation um, uh, for reference. Uh, one of the requirements of the tool is that there's, there, we're seeing um, behavior that gets you uh, in conflict with the law. So, um, so that's kind of one of the criteria. The kids are doing that poorly. If there was a, it, it, we have not developed yet, uh, to the best of my knowledge, um, a screening tool that could be done uh, by families. And I think part of the piece is there is that um, certainly if it's a biological family or there's any connection with a biological family, you, you would be able to know whether or not there is prenatal exposure and you could just take that with you to get for an assessment so that FASD would be ruled in or out um, based on the, the diagnostic criteria. So you wouldn't necessarily need a screening, you don't, you wouldn't necessarily need a screening tool. You would have a child who wasn't making their developmental milestones, um, either so, with social skills or academic function. Um, and uh, so, so that the, the information is, would already be much more neatly uh, packaged, I think. Okay, was that uh, further clarified the question, or does that answer the uh, the, the audience member's question? Well, he hasn't posted any kind of follow up, so we'll we'll assume that for now that is his uh, that answer is satisfied. <laughs> oh, actually, he put in a clarification. He said the Asante screen is used with probation officers rather than the youth themselves. Would it be useful to think about developing a tool to use with youth themselves? Sometimes they might have information. Well, that's a great question. I don't. I, I, I don't know whether or not. Uh, certainly, probably through the process of interviewing youth, that, that you may be able to get some information. But it. it but um, I think it may be uh, certainly some of the elements of the screening tool are, are a little bit more reflective, and uh, and we also know that that sometimes uh, youth, certainly youth with FAS. D would have would have some uh, sequencing and memory issues, and and that we may not. While some of their information may be reliable, um, we wouldn't want to count on that necessarily. Um, but that's a. But it may be that youth probation officers are able to get some of that information from the youth themselves. I, I wouldn't exclude that as a as a uh, as a part of the process. And, and, and we certainly you wouldn't be using a screening tool to identify youth on self-respondent uh, uh, questions uh, to determine whether they likely have FASD mm -hmm. or not, or whether or not they are likely to commit a crime or not. So um, certainly as part of the diagnostic assessment, we, uh, we question the youth about um, a number of their abilities and, and part of a psychological evaluation they they have to respond to a number of, of questions to assess cognitive abilities memory etc so um, I think it's an interesting question but the reliability of asking the individual whether they think they have the condition or not if they don't quite know what is required for a diagnosis might be uh, uh, problematic um, 
but the youth are interviewed and uh, uh, and you know the question might be can we incorporate some of the information from youth themselves in the screening tool and that that is interesting we we um, we have not used that but some of the history actually might come from the youth directly that might help towards this uh, screen um, tool so how who we ask the question it has to be somebody who knows the individual well and some Sometimes these individuals' view of their abilities are uh, are are maybe not accurate or and maybe exaggerated. All right. And I think we would want to be really cautious about suggesting that somebody has a disability before we know that they have a disability. And because of the stigma that was certainly identified in our research and, and certainly in all of the work that I have done in my fellowship, stigma associated with the disability was, was a factor, um, is that we want, to, we want to go very cautiously towards, towards that. It's not just, um, uh, it, it can be pretty impactful. Um, and until we have a, um, until we're more comfortable with this, uh, with this disability and the language around it, we need to be really comfortable that we're make sure that we're not doing damage to to family relationships. We have long term negative impacts. Uh, Dan, Dan just put in a follow-up comment and he said they've been working on a screen for women in treatment that seems to be having some good results in recognizing those who may have an FASD. Excellent. Yeah. Is, is that, I would hope that that would be something that they're putting in uh, with, uh, uh, with this organization um, just so that that could be included in the, the toolkit or, you know, can, can receive some support. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's Elaine, and um, I'm going to speak to Dan. Uh, Dan, if you would be willing to share that um, sort of mothers in or women in treatment uh, tool with us, um, that would be very much appreciated. And, and Ab, I, I'm sure, you know, I'll turn to you to speak to that as well. But I think just having that knowledge of what other tools are out there uh, to help enhance uh, CAFC screening toolkit, but really more importantly, to provide that um, those resources to those who need it. So I'm not sure, Dan, if that's possible or not, but uh, I'd like to put it out there as a suggestion. Yes, it's, it's Ab. It's, it, part of our research in uh, a women's uh, prison in Eastern Canada does have an extensive questionnaire asking them about their own health, their mental health, their knowledge of the family, their past experiences, and such. And that, that we use towards trying to understand the individual better. But it, none of their responses are used in terms of uh, determining whether they have FASD or not. Uh, that would be done based uh, on... Uh, you know, a screening tool, uh, there, and there's a self-administered screening tool that has been developed through the uh, male adult study in the prairies that we've adapted to the women's study. But um, And that, that the men's study is available on the web, but that screening tool that we used for a behavioral screening checklist right. is available through uh, Correction Services Canada on their web page. They can request a PDF in English or French. Uh, it's about 165 pages, and they're welcome to look at that. And that is being evaluated in other uh, other ju jurisdictions of uh, federal and uh, provincial or territorial um, uh, incarceration units. Okay. But uh, we, we're just talking about youth justice here specifically now. And I think that that's an interesting concept, but maybe not uh, directly applicable to uh, the two studies that we've done here. Right, right, right. And Dan did say that they are refining it and are certainly we're willing to share it when it's ready, and they have submitted it for publication. So. Okay, very good. That's great. 
Um, the next question was about, uh, is just asking, is the Asante tool in the public domain for anyone to use? Um, and we do have on the screen in front of you is the, is the page on our Knowledge Exchange Network with the, uh, with the toolkit, um, which lists all of the tools, the NST tool, the Maconi information about meconium screening, uh, maternal drinking guide, the medicine wheel tool, and this one down here, FASD screening and referral form for youth probation officers. This is, uh, some of the resources are here. Um, in some of these links down here, the references are more information uh, about the uh, Asante tool. And in, in the attachments, there's a couple of uh, more links around the youth probation officer screening and referral tool. So it is all on the Knowledge Exchange Network. If you just search for screening toolkit and FASD, it should come up. Uh, and the next question is uh, also, is it available in French? And yes, uh, some of the information on our website on the Knowledge Exchange Network is translated. This is one of them. Um, so all of the uh, information about the toolkit is available uh, in French. Um, and, sorry, go ahead. It's Sheila speaking. It's just um, um, so you know when you uh, when you apply to, uh, when you upload the uh, Santi Center screening tool, they, there is a quick little questionnaire. They they are interested in knowing who who is accessing the tool. It's but it's free. But they are kind of tracking where it's going. So just so you everyone has a heads up on that. They're just. Uh, some information. All right. Sorry, no, that's okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, the probation officer screening for FASD. Are they doing this in Manitoba only or in Ontario as well? Or are there any other provinces that are where this is uh, happening? Well, we know that in Ontario, you know, that, that uh, in our local region, uh, they're definitely screening and using the tool now um, uh, and, and using the tool as part of the screen. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the hope uh, is that uh, with this information, more and more probation officers, youth probation officers uh, in Ontario uh, will be uh, using the tool. Our recommendation is to... Our recommendation, our recommendation is that uh, you know we, we explore this research a little further, and that, um, that the training uh, is uh, is placed in concert with the with the with the screening tool uh, to see more uptake. Uh, so we'll send our recommendations into the ministry, and we suspect, we hope, uh, but we don't know uh, that we'll see more 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 uptake in in, in the province of Ontario. And it's just to comment on the Manitoba situation, uh, we have not recommended the Asante tool uh, for probation officers uses except as part of this uh, trial research, which will help inform us about whether or not this is something that we will adopt and recommend. Um, and then the next question uh, from Carolyn is uh, asking, um, Regarding probation officers that are sending, so positive. So, if, if I'm assuming she means if someone gets a positive screen with this and gets sent for diagnosis, uh, are they doing this just with youth, or are they doing this with adults as well? And again, do you know if it's being done in which provinces or how widespread this practice is? Well, for our research, we only we only explored youth probation officers, so I couldn't speak to what's happening with the adult population in, 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 in using a screening tool, but perhaps Ab would be the expert there. Right. Well, I think, that, yeah, this question has been asked even about the, uh, the screen that we used in the prison, the behavioral ch checklist uh, through the uh, incarcerated adults. Uh, I, I, you know, these tools are developed for specific groups, and I think extending it to groups that don't involve youth offenders may be a bit dangerous. There is a, the, the school for school age individuals, the neuro um, behavioral screen tool um, that is being uh, trialed in a number of uh, centers, the, the NST tool. Um, and um, uh, that that is probably more appropriate for youth. I, I'm not sure about adults. We we. We, but we can't can't equate a screen tool for those who have already got into trouble with the law for individuals who don't have trouble with the law because that's a very specific subgroup. Well, that sort of leads into our next question. Uh, the next question is actually asking: uh, Would the Asante tool be useful for teens in youth protection centers here in Quebec? The example he's using is in Quebec. Many youth are in youth centers for behavior issues and not necessarily placed in detention centers. C certainly, when um, uh, 
Oh, that's such a good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not, I thought I knew the answer. I, I'm not sure that I do. I think that we need to, um, I think that if we're, if youth are having problematic behavior that has them in, uh, in treatment or in uh, institutional care, not even in any kind of care. I think that we need to be thoughtful and understand uh, that there may be, an or we need to rule out uh, organic brain injury in terms of their behavior profile. And I think that, um, uh, so that's what we, that's what's beneficial. We can't only look at behavior as behavior and assume um, mental a health disorder without considering that it could be an or, or organic in nature. And um, so that good assessments uh, with a consideration that they're uh, ruling in or out prenatal alcohol exposure is likely the, is the way forward for that. Because what we know now is that we, if we're in, if we're putting kids in institutions because of dis dysregulated behavior or inappropriate behavior, we need to know what the genesis of that is, uh, whether it's mental health or um, or something or, or organic brain injury, and that needs to be assessed properly. Yeah, we we recommend in terms of youth, children and youth. Uh, who are in care. In fact, um, the, the, the fairly good study was done in Manitoba uh, among the ch children in care with child and family services and protection services that the prevalence of FASD or suspected FASD with significant prenatal alcohol exposure was 17%. So that is a high risk population, um, but uh, you know, there has to be some evidence garnered about their development, their academic achievement, their behavioral issues, and prenatal alcohol exposure. Um, and, uh, yeah, we're assessed to determine whether the alcohol is behind, prenatal alcohol is behind some of the, their difficulties. And then that would would trigger a referral to, to a diagnostic center. And... Uh, well, I guess... Healed with diagnostic centers, of course. But so I guess the question was, could the screening tool be used for that ab in in that setting? Well, uh, the Asante tool. Yeah, that was the question. Yeah, I know, and it's been asked before. And I say uh, the the Asante tool was specifically designed for children uh, who mm -hmm. have had trouble with the law. That's so right. I can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. I don't so, think it's necessary. Some of the questions may be appropriate; others may not be appropriate to reply. Yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying, and I agree. Yeah. That's what I was going to say, too. It's, it's difficult to extrapolate because this tool was tested using uh, children who are in youth who are troubled with the law. But, you know, it would be maybe worth looking at the tool and seeing if it can be adapted to the specific population that uh, that person's wondering about. You know, if we're if we're putting kids in, in institutions, you know, I think we need to be saying that that, that they knew, need good assessment, and um, that, and and as part of the assessment process, uh, the, the Canadian diagnostic guidelines for FASD are really helpful in terms of identifying um, when a, when a, a, alcoholic uh, alcohol may be a, a factor and and directing us towards care. We know that kids with high uh, rates of problematic behavior, um, you know, that uh, who are really difficult to manage, that often that's organic, that can be organic in nature, and that it, that an assessment uh, and considering the diagnostic guidelines could be really helpful. Are you, are you doing a good assessment that identifies, uh, you know, uh, impairments in, in three areas of brain function? 1.5 to two standard deviations below the norm, and and that's really much more helpful, even if we don't know the etiology of the of the of the issue that it, whether or not it's alcohol or not. But it can tell us that there's it's a organic in nature as opposed to uh, uh, environmental or reactive. 
Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the National Screening Toolkit that CAFC and our steering committee have been dealing with for a number of years, uh, that we are reviewing uh, and updating uh, in the literature what tools may have become available since we did our initial reviews about five years ago or six, six years ago to inform us about uh, you know, what is going on and what has been enhanced in the last several years so that we know there are gaps and groups of children that we may be, we are missing in, in, in having a screen tool uh, that might be applicable to all age groups, uh, including adults. So, um, you know, there are gaps, but, uh, you know, we want to be informed first by the literature and evidence-based uh, before we start making comments about ut utilizing various tools on a general basis. There are lots of tools out there when you go on the web, but a lot of these have not been very well validated. One of the, one of the uh, important uh, uh, functions of the National Screening Tool Screening Committee is to, to review the tools that are out there and make recommendations only on those that seem to be, have uh, good validation and use in specific groups. Yeah. Well, speaking of other screening tools, the next question is uh, asking, uh, is the group aware of the OBD triage screen that is being used in Alberta? And if you are aware, can you comment on it? She sa she is, she's saying it's being used in the adult institutions with the goal to set up diagnostic teams within the institution. Um, well, that, that will be part of our review. If it's been peer reviewed and published, or if it's been uh, published as a report by a credible uh, body um, and validated, uh, then then for sure. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I must admit ignorance of specifically what that screen involves and who's developed it and and its validation. But but the CAT C group is particularly related to screening for children and not adults. So. We, we really haven't looked at, at that issue in, in any depth, but I, maybe others are more aware of and more knowledgeable of the OBD screen. I've never heard of it. Neither have I, but I'm not very familiar with the adult population. So. And I, I am familiar with the adult population, and um, I may, I've, I've heard of this before, but I'm not sure that uh, how well it's been validated and uh, the evidence for its sensitivity and specificity, which we uh, really would require before we'd recommend its general use. All right. And uh, Liz, uh, you know, is the one that's mentioned this tool. Please feel free to uh, send uh, some information to us at CAFC, to uh, Elaine or myself. Uh, you know, we'll be happy to bring it to the steering committee if it's, uh, if it's relevant, and they can certainly have a look. And, and I think I, I probably know Liz, and I, I, I'm sure she showed me that screen. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if I could get a copy of that again too to review and look at the validation, that'd be great. I just, uh, it, it's Elaine, everyone, and and as App said earlier, uh, I want to say thank you to all of our speakers. Um, this has been another outstanding webinar. Thank you. For all your leadership and and uh, tremendous work there's a lot of new knowledge that you brought to this afternoon and um, maybe just one super quick question related to um, Howard and Sheila's presentation and then I'm I'd like to put it out to Ab and Deepa as well I, I was delighted to see some of your data Howard and Sheila around the the impact of on confidence of the probation officers, first of all, in terms of um, content information around FASD itself, and then also in the application of the tool and, and so forth. Deepa and, and Ab, through the various phases of, of your, your work, um, was, was that a similar finding? Did, did, you, did you, even if sort of anecdotally or observational, uh, at this point, but any comment on that? Sort of the, the, the data that Howard and uh, um, Sheila shared with us. 
Yeah, we're, we're gathering that di data to l ask their opinions about the utility of this tr tool. Right, so that's yeah. part of the research we're doing prospectively. So we'll have that information, I hope, at the end of the study period. Okay. Yeah, we haven't really uh, received an opportunity for the probation officers to give feedback for the tool because they haven't, they've just this month started applying it. Okay. Um, but initially during the training sessions, they did look at it and say, oh, this looks easy. But that mostly is all we've kind of heard. Right. Anyway, I just I just wanted to to you know congratulate everyone again on on uh, just a fantastic presentation. Thank you. So that is the, that is the end of the questions. Uh, if any of our panel has any other uh, comments, uh, this would be great to close off the session with. With that silence, I guess that gives you your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Time you take it away. <laughs> I guess so. All right. Well, I guess it's my turn to thank all the presenters and, and the audience. Uh, you know, thanks to the presenters for bringing such great content, as uh, Elaine said, and, and for really continuing this, our, the, the great success of this uh, our webinar series on FASD screening tools. Uh, it certainly has been some of our most popular content and continues to be. Our next uh, webinar on the FASD screening tool series is uh, on the NST Neurobehavioral screening tool and that's on uh, April 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, so uh, we should have some information. We don't have the registration up for that quite yet, but we should have that uh, coming shortly. Uh, and the next webinar in the CAFC Presents webinar series is next, when uh, next Wednesday at our usual time, 11 Eastern Time, uh, and it is on uh, a new paradigm of cancer care for adolescents and young adults. Maybe not exactly in the wheelhouse of this audience. Uh, it's a little bit different, but uh, uh, you're certainly more than welcome to come and join us on that webinar. So uh, thanks again to all of our presenters and to the audience for uh, joining us today, and hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Bye. <laughs>